Now I am honored to invite to the stage the speakers of this session on economic decision-making in an era of uncertainty. Dr. Moran Ophir, who is a senior speaker and scholar at the Reichman University, as well as Dr. Shmuel Abramson, senior deputy to chief economist. We have two more guests, so please bear with me. At the chief uh, deputy, senior deputy to chief economist at Israel's Ministry of Finance, Tal Harel Matetiao, chief of staff of the supervisor of banks and director of the strategy and special projects unit bank of, from the Bank of Israel. And last but not least, Ranin Mordi. She will be our moderator, and she is the head of the Bank of Poalim Center for Financial Growth and is a creative and inspiring executive. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Hello to all the people who are here with us and all those watching us on live stream. I'm uh, truly excited for this panel, especially because it's at the best possible time. We didn't plan this ahead of time, right, Amos? But what we're going to discuss now is the most important thing in view of everything that's happening. And of course, I'm referring to the uh, increase uh, of the interest rate from yesterday. It went up by a quarter of a percentage point for the fourth time in a row. And uh, for the 10th time in a row, I remember it started last year in July, and uh, we've seen an increase in uh, the interest rate 10 times since. Not only that, but we're also talking about the um, rising prices of many products. Uh, it's going to start immediately next week after we celebrate uh, Shavuot. And also for the state budget, hopefully the state budget will be passed today as well, as well as all the legislation processes and the changes uh, that uh, they want to introduce into the judiciary. And something I'd like to say on a personal note as a woman, as a member of the Arab community with all the violence we see in Israel in general, but also specifically within the Arab sector, and it has a lot of impact on the financial situation and the current uncertainty. So perhaps the global situation is can't really predict what's going to happen if we talk about the war between Russia and the Ukraine, uh, like uh, the previous speaker said, they thought it would end quickly, but it's been more than a year and it doesn't seem to come close to an end. And the energy crisis and climate change, all that impacts us directly, us as individuals, as corporations, as banks, as countries. And we are here today on this panel. We're trying to see the full picture, to understand, to assess it, to see what ways there are to cope with this situation. I'll try to address that. I can tell you that perhaps the only certainty is, or the only certain thing is that we're facing uncertainty. That's the only certain thing. So let's start with uh, the panelists, and let's start with our minority. Today our minority is a man, Dr. Shmuel Abramson, Senior Deputy to Chief Economist from the Israel's Ministry of Finance. He'll talk about long-term strategic planning of Israel's economy and what's the right thing to do in an environment environment characterized by such a high level of uncertainty. Uh, we also have Tal Harel Matitiao, Chief of Staff of the Supervisor of Banks and Director of the Strategy and Special Projects Unit from the Bank of Israel, especially in view of the collapse of certain banks overseas in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, we uh, would like to hear from you how the uh, banking supervision uh, system sees this thing, how it examines these things. And we also have with us Dr. Moran Ophir senior lecturer and researcher at Reichman University, and she'll introduce the subject from the perspective of individuals. We, as individuals, how can we uh, cope with a world with such high level of uncertainty when we have quite a few behavioral biases? So like I said earlier, we're going to start with our male minority. Um, how do you, Dr. Shmuel, characterize uncertainty in the world that you come from, and which factors uh, impact uncertainty? Thank you very much, Ranin. 
I'd like to first of all say that we are indeed talking a lot about uncertainty and people feel that there's a lot of uncertainty today. But I think that from a historic perspective, I'm not sure that this current situation is that different from what we had in the past. And I think uh, this also is related to what we heard from Aram Gev. Uh, in previous years, people couldn't project. And on certain times, we thought that we're controlling uncertainty with the great moderation of the beginning of this millennium and uh, the mil uh, millennium in the 1990s. And it's. Uh, it turns out that we really didn't know how to assess uncertainty. And also, this uh, is uh, true for COVID that kind of came out of nowhere. So this topic of uncertainty, these wild cards, what was uh, presented as multidimensional uncertain dynamics, I think that at the end of the day, this is something that uh, humanity and mankind, and uh, from the financial perspective, has experienced in the past. So I'm not sure. Uh, I'll tell you what the two main things that, that are the most significant elements today, but I don't think that from a historic perspective, the current situation is that unusual. And if we're trying to perhaps characterize Israel, we can define two things. First, one is the judiciary reform. Of course, one cannot ignore this huge elephant in the room, and uh, international economic uh, organizations also talk quite extensively about the uncertainty it bears with it. And and I'd like to say um, some things, and a lot has been said about it. I think that in such a situation of uncertainty, it also brings with it a certain opportunity. And of course, it depends on how this uh, situation, this event will evolve and hopefully will come to an end. And it's important that we also consider the fact that there are certain scenarios here that could actually reduce uncertainty. Maybe this is an opportunity for a solution or a situation that's more absolute and will actually generate uncertainty for the long run. Perhaps if this event wouldn't have occurred, things would have evolved in different scenarios in the future. So perhaps we will come out from this event in a situation that's actually more certain than if we hadn't have had this situation. And the other thing I want to mention is interest rate. A lot has been said about it now. The interest rate situation is exceptional uh, from a historic perspective. Not that we didn't have such a, a bumps in interest rate but we're coming to it after more or less a decade of an almost zero interest rate. So the people started to think that this uh, zero interest rate is the new environment and uh, this increase in the rates were jumping from 0.1 interest rate in a matter of 18 months to 4.75. It's 47 times higher, so it's indeed a drama that I think it is a certain historic precedent. So uh, the interest rate indeed is very dramatic. It's a true drama. And I think we've also accumulated some experience that we didn't have in previous crises, both in the banking system and in the political system and in the central banks. And that's why I think that here as well, we will know how to come out of this event uh, with the upper hand. Tal, thank you, Tal. You more than ever need to be very vigilant. So uh, wh how do you address uncertainty from the banking perspective? Look, we always need to be vigilant. And we heard various challenges that address an environment of uncertainty, geopolitical uh, dangers, and macroeconomic risks. But I think the biggest challenge is how to identify uncertainty. And in order to contend with this challenge, we need to have a stable banking system a durable banking system that can absorb various shocks it experiences. It can project a functional continuity, and it can uh, be engaged in decision-making in times of uncertainty and apply a policy that supports the economy, that uh, supports businesses and households. And that's our greatest challenge all the time, but definitely in an environment of uncertainty. I have to say that we held a poll recently to see senior executives in the banking system to see how they perceive uh, the upcoming risks, and they are
constantly assessing the changing environment and the uncertainty, and various observed risks were ranked. I'll address the two highest ones. I'll start with the second one. The second risk that it was said that mainly concerns the banking system is the geopolitical risk. It is quite predicted in view of the significant changes in legislation that are being promoted without a broad consensus. And the other in its maybe uh, it's the highest risk, maybe less than last year, but it's still pretty high. That's the cyber risk, cyber and IT in view of the development of the ecosystem and the change in the preferences of public to consume all the services here and now at any time, at any place. This is definitely accelerating the trend and serves as a fertile ground for the increase in cyber risks, both in scope and in uh, intensity and in frequency. And if we look at the world and what's happening and the macroeconomic risks that are impacting the world and how these impact us. Let me address this briefly. Of course, we cannot ignore what happened in the U.S. and the failure found in major banks. And then people ask, can it happen here? These were sectorial banks. Yes, this is why of the reasons why we think that the risk of it happening here is very uh, mar uh, small. First of all, these are sectorial banks, banks that spe specialize in something very specific. Apart, according to various regulation organizations in the world, uh, their risk assessment was failure was uh, failed and if we uh, think about israel here we have very close and conservative uh, supervision some people might call it a conservative we call it responsible we have zero appetite for risk uh, for, to see a bank collapsing this is why we don't think that such risks can uh, really occur in the israeli banking system thank you very much dr moran from the research perspective what do research findings show us on how people behave behave daily in an environment with such high level of uncertainty. So thank you, Ranins. Thank you, Tal and Shmuel. We just heard the perspective of the establishment, the institutional perspective, how institutions behave in a time of high uncertainty. But at the end of the day, the economy begins and ends with us, people, individual division, uh, decision makers. We all need to decide every day. And whenever we make economic or financial decisions, there's this tension between the rationalism of the decision how much our mind impacts, how much we do cost efficiency calculations, and emotional elements, to what extent the emotions impact our decision. And when we are referring to an environment with high level of uncertainty, especially with a frequent uh, increases in prices and in interest rates, uh, the impact of emotional, psychological elements, uh, how that impacts our decision, it's increased. We see much less calculated decisions that are sometimes even harmful, uh, detrimental and harmful to us. Let me give you an example. One of the most typical biases uh, for an economy of uncertainty is the present bias. It truly reflects the phenomenon that we attribute to too much of importance to the here and now and the present, and we don't attribute sufficient weight to the future and what will happen in the future. And the example from other areas, I think it's a very good example when people are asked, how would you like, uh, what dessert would you like to have uh, for your uh, dinner next week, uh, chocolate or fruit, and 75% say fruit, but when you ask people what uh, dessert would you like to have today, fruit or chocolate, then 75% say chocolate, because it's far off the future. We think everything's going to be okay and we'll be able to control ourselves. And that's something that's very dominant and very apparent in the financial spheres. Today we take too many loans because we want to uh, have something good we, uh, today, to go on vacation today, to buy today to do various transactions today, and we don't always consider what will happen in the future. Will we be able to pay back? And how will a trend of increased interest rate affect us in the future? And in an environment of uncertainty, an environment of inflation, this is even more heightened, and it increases our long-term risk as a society to be able to pay all these um, commitments and loans we're taking now. And another thing that has an increased effect in uh, worlds of uncertainty is 
these mental uh, calculations or accounting. We think that we're all professionals and experts. We have several mental accounts in our mind. We classify the funds for various purposes. And instead of having a holistic budget management, we set aside money for a certain event or for a vacation. And simultaneously, we're taking a loan in order to finance uh, one of our everyday activities. These are things that on regular times we can manage. But when we're talking about high level of interest rate and inflation, so this practice of having like a certain account for one purpose and to take a loan for another purpose, that could cost us a lot of money. So this is why we shouldn't adopt this practice. Practice We should always have use what we have when we're talking about expensive loans. And when we'll need the money, then maybe we can take a specific uh, earmarked loan. But our time is running out, so I'll give back the floor to Ranin. It's very interesting what you just said, because I think we can all identify, because we all make these mistakes, even though our mind says one thing, but uh, our hearts, our emotions. And the amazing thing is that even financial experts, they make the exact same mistakes, and sometimes uh, in the same scope. And many studies indicate that, well, maybe this is a hint to something at all. How is the banking supervision managing in an environment of uncertainty? What kind of supervision do you utilize? Well, first of all, it's always important to mention a few basic things for the uh, uh, the system to cope in an environment of uncertainty. Well, first of all, we need a quality a corporate governance of the banking system that the risk management system is holistic and professional to have high regulatory standards that we can pose for the banking system in comparison to the world and very close oversight. What does that mean? To learn from the experience of others from other countries to constantly monitor and follow up whether there are evolving risks and we're constantly constantly monitoring the activities. We take extreme tests in order to check the durability of the banking system for various vulnerable areas. We monitor and we're constantly uh, on top of things. And another layer that was recently added to our way of monitoring is to see what's happening in the social media platforms where we saw that when we analyzed the Silicon Valley Bank, that event, we saw that this was the first time that we experienced a viral run on the bank, public trust, public trust in that specific bank was a impacted very quickly. And in a matter of hours, dozens of people withdrew their funds from the bank. And the way the information is transferred in the social media platforms, the information is passed on very quickly. And if the panic that it generates is justified or not, it doesn't matter because the panic is generated. And it has an infectious effect. And that requires a much more monitoring and a much speedier response time so that we can prevent and thwart and respond to the public and maintain public trust in the banking system so that we can deal with all these implications. Dr. Shmuel, I have a short question for you. How do you manage a country's economy in a time of uncertainty? I'm sure it's a pretty uh, thorough and long answer. Yes. Well, let me say two things as a general uh, lines. First of all, you have the basics, and it's connected to what Moran talked about, because ultimately, at a time of uncertainty, of course, there is no time for adventures like leveraging and loans in projects or activities that you don't know for sure that you'll be able to pay back. And the coordination with the government, that's pretty clear. That's fiscal responsibility. This is the time to maintain fiscal responsibility in the state budget that was passed by the government and will probably be approved by the Knesset this week represents exactly that. We suggest a deficit of less than 1% of the GDP, both in a historic perspective and as an international perspective. This is a very conservative and responsible uh, conduct, and it, it certainly corresponds uh, with the Bank of Israel's policy not to increase uh, demand uh, too much, uh, given the inflation environment. And I'd like to also say that I think that Israel, at the end of the day, can be proud of this. We have some fierce debates on the components, the makeup of the budget. But fiscal responsibility has almost become consensus. You know, the political discussion 
hardly insists on this deep understanding that Israel managed to receive. And it's not always obvious that uh, we need to have fiscal responsibility and that it should manifest itself in the budget. Another thing is this robust strategy that we need to employ when facing uncertainty. That means that whatever the scenario, certain things have to be done. It doesn't matter if the reality is better or worse. Anyhow, there are several vectors that we need to pay attention to, and these are the structural reforms, and there are quite a few uh, investments that are uh, growth uh, biased, and there are a lot of things that we need to do in Israel. One is uh, increasing competitiveness and competition and uh, increasing productivity of Israeli employees. We must continue with that. The issue of investing in infrastructure, that's also something very significant, and I hope that the budget that will be approved will reflect that as well, uh, and I hope that the follow-up policy will also be related to all that. Yes, I uh, hope along with you, and hopefully it will uh, encompass all sectors and make all the adaptations. Dr. Morano Fir, how does uncertainty uh, impact investors and the capital market? So, with respect to the capital market, I'm not only talking about uh, loans and solid investments. Uh, uncertainty has a significant impact on the la long run as well. It impacts uh, various population groups, and there are terms, uh, periods in the past in which markets were characterized by a high level of uncertainty. For example, the generation that experienced the Great uh, Depression is a generation that significantly invested less in the capital market for decades in comparison to the uh, following generations, even though we know that if you had invested during the Depression, then you would have may come up with a very high return. In, uh, Myself and uh, Dr. Guy Hoffman and Professor Shachar Eyal from this university, we did a long-term uh, study during uh, COVID, and we checked uh, before the COVID crisis and during the surges. We wanted to see how this uh, health crisis would impact our financial uh, preferences, and what we discovered that once the pandemic broke out, we all became much, much less tolerant to financial risk, so we reduced the risk levels of our investments. Uh, we phased out of the capital market, and one of the most basic and simple things I teach my students in my classes, I tell them, how will you achieve a, a return, a yield the simple, the most simple principle, buy cheap and sell uh, for a high price. But what do we see when there are crises? What do we see in the capital market? We see people selling for cheap. For example, if we look at the 2007 and 2008 crisis, in March 2009, the American capital market was at an all-time low for that period on that day after the S&P 500 dropped 50 percent in comparison to October 2007 was the largest scope of sales in the American capital market. People sold for cheap and then re-entered the capital market for a higher price. So instead of buying for cheap, selling for a higher price, people do the opposite, and then they lose value. So in the capital market as well, we need to notice the impact of uncertainty. If we have long-term investments, there's no reason to leave the capital market in a low point at a time of crisis when there's a high level of uncertainty. It's then that you need to stay, because over time, the markets will uh, rise. And if you go out when it's low, you'll simply lose. So. So uh, to conclude for uh, the people sitting in the hall and for the people uh, who watch us on the live stream, if each of you could give uh, your motto, your credo, and your perspective on a good financial conduct at an environment of uh, high uncertainty. So maybe we'll start with you, Tal. Okay. I think that it's quite clear to everyone that there is a very strong connection between public trust and the stability of the banking system. And we and the banking system, we need to see how we can strengthen public trust uh, in the banking system. And it starts by realizing that the banking system has a significant role in the social fabric and strengthening both personal resilience and the social economic resilience of the uh, population. And how do you strengthen public trust? One of the ways to do it 
it is to implement an organizational um, culture of decency, of fairness, maximizing the best interest of uh, the customer, generating value for the customer, how to create a banking that is uh, impactful, that gives value to customers and considers how we can help the customers, how we can uh, take into consideration all the interests of all the stakeholders when you formulate a system which is a stable system, which is first and foremost based on public trust. And this is uh, my request or my appeal to the banking system. As for the government, I think the motto is quite clear. At such a time, the right thing to do is to uh, behave responsibly and uh, to generate stability and reduce any uncertainty that could be in the market through fiscal responsibility and on a more long-term perspective to continue a full force in all the reforms and investments required uh, to the Israeli economy. So I'll finish with the perspective of individuals. And here as well, I think that the rule is very clear and very simple, whether these are loans or investments in the capital market, uh, the rule that we should always stick to, and especially when we talk about times of high uncertainty, is to pause, to think, to act by pausing for a second and not rushing to decision. If we take a minute to think and only then act in contrast to our tendency to uh, act intuitively or impulsively, so that moment that we pause to think will help all of us to reach better decisions and uh, to conduct in a much uh, more correct way in times of high uncertainty that I guess will stick with us uh, in the near future. So thank you, Moran. Well, I have to say that my motto, I got it from my grandma, and it's indeed to be constantly prepared to the unexpected, anything that could happen in life. She would always say in Arabic, she always said that white money, that is the money that we get in uh, good times, in good days, is intended to uh, cover for the bad times. So thank God. These are not bad times or, or black times, but these are great times. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. And we need to set money aside for all the uh, unexpected uh, options today as uh, the head of uh, the Financial Growth Department of Banca Polim that was established four years ago in order to give the general population tools and, and knowledge uh, to their financial behavior to help and support economic decision making because we are engaged in economic and financial decision making every day and uh, tools in such a changing environment with a high level of uncertainty we have a website which is rich with knowledge and you uh, it's accessible to the general population it's free of charge and it's in Hebrew and Arabic and also adapted to the ultra orthodox uh, sector and we'll be happy to see you hopefully you've learned something today and good news to everyone and happy Shavuot holiday.